Harold Moody's comfortable lifestyle came from hard work and dedication. His belief that he was sent here for a purpose meant that he accepted preaching commitments the length and breadth of Britain. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Alongside this, his medical practice added an exhausting round of visits. He had three different, four different surgeries at one time, actually one in the house and three outside in other premises that he worked. And he saw people. He did a lot of home visiting. Our front hall was a waiting room, so there were always patients in the house. He was always known as the Black Doctor, locally. Um, sounds a bit uh, not quite politically correct today, but I mean, nothing was meant by it. That's how he was known. And my mother thought he was a marvellous doctor. She took all the children to see him. I just went in and uh, made the signs that I was, you know, couldn't hear. And uh, I went to him about three times, and he was giving me the ear wash, you know. And uh, then finally, when I went, when he gave it the good syringe, you know, when it all softened up, oh, I thought the world was coming in. <laughs> I have asthma now, but I was always troubled with my chest. And of course, um, I was, that was the main reason I would go to visit the doctor, or my mother would take me to the doctor. And we're talking about pre-National Health Service days and, and I don't think my mother could always afford it, quite honestly. But nevertheless, I went to the doctors. Dr Moody was a kindly man, very smart man. When I say smart, I mean, we were used to lots of working class people, very few people had suits in Peckham at that time. Dr Moody was always dressed in a suit, a nice navy blue suit as I remember, with a very smart white collar and tie. Very handsome looking man. By the beginning of the 1930s, this house was the meeting place for black intellectuals in London. The Moody's Visitor's Book reads like a who's who of black history. Paul Robson, C.R.R. James, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Musei Jomo Kenyatta, Leary Constantine, by then, most of these people were young, eager students who had come to the mother country to study either medicine or law. Their parents had written to Dr. Moody to keep an eye on them while they were in this country. Moody's new role meant that he was dealing with an increasing number of calls for help. He found himself writing letters to many employers, always copying them to the colonial office, arguing for a change in the treatment of black people in the UK. He was also in great demand as a preacher around the country. And if God should ask why, I will reply, because I have work to do that no white man can do. Please send me back as black as you can make me. He had become involved with the administration and running of the Camberwell Green Congregational Church and was a deacon there. He was also the first black man to become chairman of the board of directors of the Colonial Missionary Society in 1924 and a member of the board of London Mission Society. By 1931, he was president of the London Christian Endeavour Federation. He increasingly uses the pulpits of churches that are given to him to preach a straight Christian message. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Increasingly, he's incorporating into that uh, the idea of, of race and that tolerance of race is, is, a, is a basic Christian virtue. The Negro peoples of the world have endured more oppression and persecution than any other branch of God's great family. A South African speaker estimates 
that 75% of the wealth of South Africa is earned by Africans who enjoy less than 25% of the same. But as time went on, and the plight of colored people not getting any better, he realized that preaching as well as lobbying needed to go hand in hand. Therefore, he founded the League of Colored People. Where did he get the money from? From his pocket, as well as from donations from many white people who heard him talk about equality and brotherly love being basic principles of the Christian gospel. In March 1931, the League of Colored Peoples held its first meeting. What Moody had done with the League of Colored Peoples is to proclaim it as a Christian organization. And it's a very bourgeois organization. It has a middle class leadership and it has largely a middle class following, which is of both white and black. As Moody argued, the title of the League's journal is The Keys. You cannot play the piano unless you play the black and white keys together. And so he's talking about racial harmony and racial cooperation. And what he was very keen to do was to attract to the League meetings uh, colonial governors, senior government figures, people who could speak authoritatively about colonial issues to raise the profile of the League and to increase its, its influence in, in government circles. It was a very broad organisation, and I think this is Moody's you know, great legacy. There's such a, an organisation which campaigned, which lobbied, which fought, which organised, was created and which endured you know, for, that, for that length of time. Now, at the same time, it's true to say that, particularly in his early years, or the early years of the League of Coloured Peoples, he was very uh, soundly criticised and denounced particularly from those who were more radical than he was. He was particularly accused of, uh, you know, being an Uncle Tom, <clears throat> of working with the colonial office in Britain. And, and this is true, he did work with the colonial office. He tried to ingratiate himself with the colonial office, partly, I'm sure, for his own, you know, his own self-aggrandizement, but also probably because he thought that was a way of getting things done. 